Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, making it out for after lunch. I'm sure everyone's trying to keep their energies up for a whole afternoon set of talks. Um, and I'll lead off with talking about taming the Kotlin compiler. Um, for those I haven't met yet, my name is John Rodriguez. I work. Uh, I go by J Rod, and I work at Square specifically on the Cash App product. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about how the Kotlin compiler. Um, we all love Kotlin as uh, the language that we work with day to day, but um, build speeds, of course, play a huge role in our day to day as well. Um, particularly if we're using things like annotation processing and even multi-platform, or just switching between branches in our day to day. And so um, I want to kind of think of this as like a case study of just you know, little recipes of what I've discovered or encountered with my teammates um, in developing Cash App and hopefully um, share some of that insights with you. Um, this is going to be a replay of a talk that I gave in Joycon Toronto with Igor Andreevich, who's on my team. Um, and also some uh, information re regarding multi-platform that I spoke about in Kotlin Conf just a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, for those of you who prefer to follow slides online, uh, there's a bit.ly link that I encourage you to just quickly take a picture of or uh, click on. I also will be share the slides are already up on speaker deck. That's what this link goes to. Um, I'm not sure if they're processing yet though, so sorry for that. Okay, so um, about, I want to say, three, four years ago, um, Square dove in into Kotlin. This was early when Jake was with the company. He was really involved with uh, JetBrains um, in terms of realizing that Kotlin is the future. Kotlin is the future given the spate of Java development. How can we evolve this? And so um, if we look back to about a few years ago, you'll see that the breakdown of Java to Kotlin was very heavily Java. And now we fast forward to today, or recently, and uh, we see we swung mostly the other way. Um, in that process, we've noticed that our build times, that we build all, uh, basically we do a two by two um, build type and build flavor matrix, but we disable one because production debug doesn't really make sense. And so we have internal debug, that's what we use as developers. We have internal release, that's what we push to our internal employee play store so that Square employees can dog food the app early. And then production release is what we push to the public on the Play Store. And so here's the build times that um, more or less indicative of an all Java world. <clears throat> and then when we moved to a Kotlin world, we started to see these times creep up. Now, this is a bit of a red herring. I'm also leaving out the fact that we wrote feature code in three years. And so there's obviously going to be a contribution there. But I wouldn't be surprised if you're encountering similar in your day to day. So um, let's start by going from trivial cases of why this might be and move our way up into some real world examples. And so, is Kotlin actually slower? To start off, um, we wrote this uh, benchmark of just iterating over some level of n and just writing to the file system a shell, an empty class incrementing so that we can see when we pass n files to the Java compiler via the command line, what, how long does that take? We timed it, we log it out to output, and then um, because the way, if you ever invoke Java C directly on the command line, you can, you're limited by how many files you can list in the class path, there's a way that you can invoke the Java compiler with a file that lists these. Um, it's like a one line per class file. And so here we are with our very first attempt to kind of see, all right, let's compare Java to Kotlin. And of course, we do the same for Kotlin with the Kotlin compiler. We iterate where n goes from 1 to 3,000 files. And it's just literally like, all right, to compile one file, compile two files, all the way up to compile three files. And just by sheer command line invocation, you start to see like Kotlin C is, is definitely slower. And these are trivial classes. Um, why is that? Maybe it's reading the I.O. is a little uh, less efficient. Who knows? Um, but then, of course, the next natural step is no one invokes Kotlin C or Java C directly. You're probably working with a build tool like Gradle. So why don't we then morph this example to start looking at more pay performance characteristics that we'll see in a day-to-day. -day. And so here we are, the same example, but now we evolve it instead to use Gradle. And so, yeah, that's what this looks like, and we've moved to more like bash syntax here. So now if we take the graph from before, and we're in superpose the new data, we see, okay, now the penalties of Kotlin C 
are brought down to be uh, similar to the, the trend lines of where Java was, and wh what could that be? And so um, it's not, uh, hopefully you've, by now with your experience with Gradle, you've seen things like incremental compilation come into play, and so that's kind of like where this will play in, but if you're just new to Gradle, um, this is basically what incremental compilation provides for you. Um, another thing to notice is if you look at your Java processes that run after invoking a few Gradle builds, you're not only creating a Gradle daemon that stores like shared state, the Kotlin compiler also has its own daemon that tries to outweigh some of these like boot up times. Like just the boot up time of the Kotlin compiler itself can be expensive. Um, and then having to do its work afterward, it's better to have it in a demonized mode. And so these trend lines show that off the, off the get-go. What's even more telling is if we just look at like the percentage, the number, the percent increase as we increase the number of files, it's clear that having Gradle on top of the underlying compilation um, helps greatly. Now, that doesn't mean that Gradle's um, foolproof and doesn't have its own flaws, but we can see that at least its very fundamental premise is useful here. So now that we've looked at these really trivial use cases, let's start evolving this into something that'll be more in your app. Um, instead of using empty Java or empty Kotlin classes, let's actually look at real classes. And so a really good example to work with, um, we, we open source this library called Wire. How many people here use a protocol buffers versus JSON-based APIs? Okay, and so I would assume then most people are using JSON-based APIs. By a show of hands, who's using JSON-based APIs? Okay. And then XML. Okay, so bulk of the room is JSON. And so the TLDR, if you're not familiar with protocol buffers, is that instead of having stringified key value pairs in a JSON file, protocol buffers, whether you use wire or thrifty or some other variant, is supposed to provide type safety and also a sense of schema. Um, some other downstream benefits that don't really play in that much is that you're compressing the bytes over the wire. And so for really large payloads, you may or may not be more efficient. And the reason why I say may or may not is because you could also gsip your JSON as well and achieve pretty good performance characteristics. Um, but nonetheless, we have a library called JSON, uh, sorry, Wire, um, that two, two of my teammates, Benoit and Igor, talked about at Drake NYC. And so because we're working on creating this library, I figured, okay, we have a set of protocols, a, a set of object classes. Let's traverse the protograph and see if we can incrementally check out a real class performance characteristic. Um, here's a link to the talk if you're interested in seeing more. So let me give you a little bit of intro to Cash App just because it, it helps with the context here. I work on um, Cash App, for, for people who aren't familiar, is a uh, US and UK based peer-to-peer -peer payment structure. In the US, um, the way that banks manage money movements interbank is a lot different than European markets. And so marketplaces like Cash App ex exist for things like Cash App or Venmo or other alternatives. And so I work specifically on this prepaid debit card that we try to incentivize people who don't have necessarily the funds to justify like high cost accounts, they can get this, this card. And to make it more fun, if we click on the card when they order it, we allow you to customize like the type of card and do, and do things where you can customize it by drawing on it or adding emojis or stamps. And then finally, when you finish rendering the card, you'd order this and it ships it and then we add your your handle, we call it a cash tag, similar to a Twitter handle, just to like personalize this. Okay, so wh why did I go into that? Is that now we can start talking about the protocol buffer structure for something like this. We have some response from the server that'll give us this card customization data high level object, this root object. It'll be comprised of something representing a theme, which right now you saw was simply black or white, but Coming down the pipeline will be things like different variations, metal card, see, like invisible see-through card, glass cards, or maybe custom artwork. And then you have something that represents the actual user customization. They touched the screen, they drew something, that's in what's touch data is. That can be broken down further. That can be broken down into strokes and stamps. And then finally, all these are represented on a canvas by some set of points. And so here we have a nice diamond graph, a nice small representation of objects now, you'll realize that in my trivial example, I can just add Java temp1, Java temp2, and it doesn't really matter which one I compile first, there's no dependencies. Here, there clearly are dependencies, so I have to build from the bottom up, which is why this is a great study, because now you have to do things like breadth first search and some cool little algorithms to find out how can I incrementally compile an object uh, in order to show this. So now, if we go back to our example before, we see the performance characteristics from the trivial cases. 
Let's zoom in on the, the, the Gradle stuff, because like I said, the stuff calling Java C and Kotlin directly don't really matter. This is what that looks like. And now if we layer in protos on top of it, we see it's actually not a lot more. Like even though you have to do cross-linking references, in a, non, a trivial class versus a real world class did not have that much more impact and from your compilation standpoint. And to see um, the, the vertical axis here is in seconds. And I did um, an analyze this up to um, 500 protos. And in fact, um, I just realized that I'm missing, I had another slide that showed up to 5,000 protos. And that trend line still remained flat. And so um, that's, good. that's nice. So now let's take it up into even more real world example. Let's say you're modularizing your app. We have our app module. And what we try to do is uh, move all of our presenter logic to be JVM based, no Android dependencies. And we have a very reactive architecture. Um, I, I must confess, I'm not very good at like, knowing the nuances between MVI versus clean versus MVVM. But I think this is like closest to MVVM, where you have like, a JVM based presenter, an Android based view, and they talk to each other using like, a reactive RX Java stream, where you have a stream of view models going one way and a stream of view events representing your user interactions going the other way. And so if you use a similar architecture, what we then try to do is have the backend based things, the, the, the service objects, split into a JVM representation, which will have um, the actual like, implementation details, and then interfaces in the API, because you know, there's Dagger, there's a lot of class path stuff that you want to work around. And so this is just a nice little, uh, small micro view of how Cash App is organized. Here are the associated plugins that we apply to this, because now we're going to start delving into like, some of the more like, bits of Gradle. And so we see that um, because we're only a bunch of interfaces and we're removing any Android uh, dependencies in our inputs and outputs, we can just rely on the Kotlin JVM plugin at that bottom node. As we move up, we see obviously we're going to be doing so well. So the presenters here have Android library stuff. and it, that I must admit, we do do that because of things like parcelable, and we're trying to like move away um, from intents, uh, moving our intents to be like maps, and moving our parcelable to be some other way of representing that. Uh, but for now, it's not completely um, eliminated. And then on the JVM side, we're going to have because we're going to have modules and bindings, we're going to have some capped involvement, and then at the top, finally, the Android application. So first thing you should think is like capped, and so. Um, how many people here are familiar with annotation processing on a high level? Great, uh, because I'm not going to go into it very much. Um, there is a great talk from what now, five years ago at DrawCon NYC 2014 that Jake Wharton gave that holds true today because Java annotation processing hasn't changed since Java 5. And so the concept of multiple rounds and processors spitting out cogen that could then be used in further uh, rounds still applies. And that's the link to that talk. I want to talk specifically, though, about CAPT, Kotlin's annotation processing, because if you look at like, JetBrains' site on how the Kotlin compiler and the Java compiler interact, like, if you want to have mixed source sets, you need to be able to have a two-pass compilation phase, where first, your Kotlin C is going to have to be able to link those Java dependencies, spit them out into class files, and then further run that into a Java compilation form. And so, um, as you refactor your app from Java to Kotlin, you're going to be in this middle stage for a while. And the, what you're going to find is one huge portion of that performance penalty is going to come from the double pass. Um, and we'll see a bit more in a second. So going back to this graph, um, if you write some quick little Gradle code, you can start actually visualizing how your task graph works. And so how many people here are familiar with Gradle? In terms of like tasks are run, you run a Gradle command, maybe you hit the play button in Android Studio, and all of a sudden, all this magic happens under the covers. And so um, as you can probably see from like the small lines going off the, the, with the viewport of this slide, this graph is huge. I am deliberately focusing on these five nodes. And so specifically, um, these five nodes and how they're interconnected to each other Let's look at what CAP does first. And so there's a concept of generating stubs. Well, what is that? The truth is, is that Kotlin has no concept of annotation processing in itself. Um, it delegates that. However, to delegate that to Java's annotation processing, 
Java's annotation processing, again, written in Java 5, has no idea of what Kotlin is. And so there's this concept of generating stubs where it has to fake out the compiler. It turns out that that's OK because um, the body, the meat of your methods don't matter. Uh, what really matters is just your application binary interfaces or your ABI. And so from taking something like this in pure Kotlin, the stub that winds up being generated looks something like this. And so this allows the Kotlin code to refer to those declarations generated by the processor with these stubs, and the stubs will contain no actual code in the methods. Um, one thing that I'm going to very hand wave over is the Kotlin metadata annotation on top, which has a proto like compressed representation of the backing Kotlin class so that downstream tasks can figure out the actual structure, in a sense, of your Kotlin class, uh, which if you've ever had to interact with some of that, there's some really good talks from last year, KotlinConf, um, by I think Eugenio Marletti and um, Zach Swears on, on really kind of grokking what's in, contained in that annotation. I mentioned what an application binary interface is, and hopefully that was straightforward, but I want to at least be very explicit about what this means here. Say you have a class like this, right? Very simple, an inject annotation, a constructor. It's inheriting from a type. It has a public field, and it has a very simple uh, input of a string, but then a generic type as an output with its own uh, parameterized type. And so all of these highlighted red things consider, are considered part of your API, your ABI, including annotations. And so that's important, right? So Because if you're exposing, say, Dagger, um, of a module, you also have to like set as an API dependency the JSR was a 203 annotations because otherwise inject won't be um, um, known by the consuming module, and so that can be important for things as we'll talk about with Gradle of compilation compilation avoidance. So from here, let's move on from capped to the rest of uh, rather from the generate debug uh, sorry the generate stubs phase to the um, actual capped phase. And so the truth is, is that um, capped is, this is where capped is going to then take that Java stub from the Kotlin source, and then any <coughs> Java source that was mixed in that source set, and delegate that to APT. Now, there are, um, there are murmurs that JetBrains is rewriting capped again in the form of capped 3. And the idea is that it's a complete rewrite of annotation processing to completely bypass Java's annotation processing because of the fact that it hasn't evolved in so long. But until that comes out, this is how CAPT works. There's a stub and then delegation to Java APT. And then finally, we move on to true compilations. That means your stubs were generated. Java apt took those stubs with the Java source and finally generated the factories and everything, and then compile that down to, cl uh, to classes in this phase. And so we come back full circle. And as you can see, now you might be wondering, why are my builds slow? <laughs> well, besides having to do that, um, there's, well, yeah, basically, the capped process is really slow. But we're going to also start showing you um, a set of tools that can help you maybe dig in to find out more. Um, so if we go to the command line, and we just do the assemble command. Um, adding the, how many people here are familiar with the profile option? Okay, about a fifth of the room, I'd say, just from a quick hand wave. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it is very important. And so this actually predates the concept of Gradle build scans, if you're familiar with it. Like Gradle build scans are useful. Maybe you don't want to send your app's information to a remote server. Maybe you don't care. Even if you're OK with sending it to a remote server, like the real pitch is getting something like Gradle Enterprise. To have, and you probably have heard of these options. But if you don't want all that, if you don't have the budget for it, if you don't want to set up an Amazon Cloud Worker to store that information, and you just want to do some like, low-level forensics just to kind of understand what's going on, profile's how you do it. Um, and so just by providing that command, you'll see a link at the end that you might have seen here. Um, that last line, see the profiling report. And so if I look at Igor's home directory, um, you'll see that the HTML file here generated will spit out some information. So things like your configuration time. If you're including, the, the, the truth is, is that when you adopt the Gradle ecosystem, you're at the behest of all the plugins you use in your app. And so maybe you're using plugins for static analysis. Maybe you're using error prone. Maybe you're using a compiler plugin. Maybe you're just using AGP because you're an Android developer. All these plugins and all the flaws that are contained in these plugins affect your app. 
and they affect your app in the configuration stage as well as the execution stage. And so looking at a report like this can help start pinpointing whether it's this plugin or that plugin. But what I tend to really look at most is tax execution. And so um, I've given talks on Gradle in the past. I don't want to go too much in like the nuances of Gradle, but it's important to know that like Gradle in every command you run will assemble a very huge graph of tasks but then only execute a subgraph of that. And the huge portion is if you run the Gradle help, it's going to assemble like this 5,000 node task graph and then execute the one node that represents help. And that's important, right? So like what you really want is the task graph, like the linking of these tasks to be cheap because the truth is you're just going to throw it away anyway. And now there are things that are coming down the pipeline with Gradle called like instant execution that will help with that. But until then, whenever that comes, this is what you're experiencing today. But there's more that you can find out from Gradle with the help of Kotlin. Kotlin provides these extra um, properties that allow you to introspect what it's doing in your build report. And so if you just like out redirect that to your Gradle properties or just write it in, um, and also enable the verbose flag, you'll get another report. And if you look at that, um, it'll look something like this. It's going to give you a similar in terms of like the task naming, but things that are going to be very specific to Kotlin task management. And so let's look into some of these things. Um, like for example, all these things were skipped because it was up to date. That's great. We could have gotten that from the, the Gradle profiling. But what else can we get? So let's start highlighting some of like Gradle features that have been around and Kotlin features for a while that have adopted those features. The build cache. Gradle's had a build cache where if you compiled classes, instead of recompiling it, you can pull them from a cache either local or remote. Kotlin's only adopted that since 1.2, which if I forget, it's like maybe a year and a half ago. And so that idea is that if you have already compiled some code and then you switch branches or you're adding on commits but then you want to go back to a previous commit, um, you shouldn't have to do any of that work again. And so the way that that works is if you Gradle clean, you assemble your app, and now you look at this report, you should see something like this. It is coming from cache. This is great. When you see this, you've done little work. At that point now, you're bounded by how fast the I.O. operations are reading it from this folder into some build directory format that Gradle can represent. I will say that if you use remote caching for your teams, you may, in some cases, be trading CPU-bound operations to now your internet bandwidth operations. And so if you have really saturated networks, <coughs> Relying on remote build cache can sometimes give you worse results. And in those cases, you may want to consider moving off of an, a Wi-Fi access point to something more hardwired. And we've done that at Square, and it probably sped up our build speeds by at least 75%. Um, so something to consider. What about incremental compilation? Uh, Colin has provided this since very early on, but CAPT didn't until 1.330. Um, and that's because it's a little harder. So do incremental capped, you have to build in this concept of like how these annotation processors, again, remember Kotlin is only generating the stubs part on its own. The rest is it's delegating to the Java annotation processing. And again, Java annotation processing has never considered incremental. Um, Gradle came out with this uh, format called uh, NCAP, which allowed you to do this with some people at Groupon about, I want to say, two years ago now. Um, and uh, people like Stefan Nicola helped like migrate a lot of these things. Like uh, I think he works on Toothpick, a DI library, and also he attempted to send a PR to Butterknife to help some of that stuff. And so Dagger, for a long time, was not incrementally uh, or enabled incremental compilation until I want to say a few releases ago. And so um, things like that um, pay small penalties overall. So we run that command, and so to see this in action. If we pipe in this new test class, we should see in a report like this something that says, OK, your generation of your stubs took this many seconds, but we detect that you've already modified this. And so even though we've already generated the stubs, we will do no additional work in terms of using that to generate source, which is great because now you have a quicker build time and your compilation took only less than a second. This is the ideal case. However, it turns out 
that there are also a lot of cases where you do not reach, reap the benefit of incremental compilation. And we saw this a lot on Cash App, and it was frustrating us. And uh, we dug in a little more as to why. So in this example, if you clean your entire repo, you build, and therefore now, because even though you cleaned your build directory, um, you should still have that cache, right? And so it hydrates every, the state of your build from the cache. But now if you do some incremental work and expect incremental uh, compilation to work here, um, by running the build and looking at the report again, you're going to see non-incremental compilation performed. And yeah, it's going to say that again here. And you're going to go, what the hell? Digging a little more, I filed an issue with UTrack. Um, here's a link if you want to follow it. I also opened this issue with uh, Gradle because I honestly didn't know who was to blame. Uh, Gradle quickly informed me that JetBrains is to blame. Um, <laughs> the problem is interesting because it's come up before. What used to happen is that CAPT used to corrupt the build cache, and they found out what was corrupting the build cache. Their solution to that was for Gradle to create an annotation called at local state. At local state is essentially telling Gradle, um, whenever you uh, use the build cache to restore the state of your build, completely destroy any incrementalism because the file paths, what, what it, the TLDR here is that they, the, the way that it's storing this information in the cache is using absolute file paths, which doesn't work well on remote build caching because everyone's machines are going to have absolute file paths that are different from another person's machine. And so when I heard that it was the local state annotation, I uh, get cloned the Gradle repository, uh, sorry, the Kotlin repo, and did a grep for the local state annotation. And it's in one spot. And I, I tried for about half an hour to fix it. But it turns out this is the abstract Kotlin compile task from which all Kotlin compile tasks extend. And so every ba basically bit of Kotlin compilation is affected by this. Um, I encourage you to. Uh, look at the talk later and follow that, that bug on Utrack. It's affecting all of you. Every time you switch your branches, the Kotlin build cache problem is basically destroying your, your, uh, optimiz your optimized builds. So let's talk about compilation avoidance. Compilation avoidance, the definition on Gradle's website just explains it all. If a dependency has changed in that only in ABI compatible way, meaning private method um, implementations or private fields, then there's no reason to recompile those Java tasks again. And so that means that, for example, if you change, if A depends on B, and B has a private field that changes, you don't need to recompile A. You just need to recompile B, and static linking will still wor work. The way that class loading on a JVM works, it will just work fine, because nothing from A's viewpoint of the B module has changed. And so this is a benefit for us because when you have a thousand modules and you change something from a leaf or mid-level module, it's nice to be able to just compile the subgraph that matters. Um, to put in these um, in more concise examples, if we look at the app module and have <coughs> presenters with an implementation uh, configuration on app, and we add a private field to that presenter in, say, the greeter presenter, and we run the command again, we should expect to see something that says that comp compilation was avoided. However, it turns out that with Kotlin, this doesn't work at all. Because there is right now no way, or there was no way, now there is a way, it just hasn't been implemented, uh, to denote what an ABI for Kotlin was. Because there's not only the, again, the, the type system, there's also the Kotlin metadata annotation. And that was a big uh, problem. And so uh, there's an open issue for that. Um, that was opened, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, and the problem here was the fact that there was no way to determine the ABI from Kotlin, which Laurent Pintier from Gradle uh, explains very well. I believe he works on the caching team, so he knows all things relating to Gradle caching. Um, but then there was an implementation now where you, would someone, don't remember who, I think it was for the Basil project, right, um, created this ability to generate an ABI jar. And now, Gradle's follow-up in saying, like, we have, we have nothing on our roadmap, but JetBrains will probably be tackling them themselves anyway. And so here's another issue to follow as well. My personal hope is that this is going to be reflected in part of the stuff that JetBrains talked about at the most recent KotlinConf, that their biggest pain is identified as build speeds. 
OK. So let's talk about multi-platform. How many people here are um, in some form working with multi-platform? OK. And Colin Kampf this year showed us that too. Whereas they've talked about it for about a year now. Slowly but surely, developer communities have been forming around it. Um, Kevin Galligan from Touch Lab has been devoting a significant portion of his time working on multi-platform for Touch Lab, but also he works with us on Cash App to move some of the libraries forward. Um, Alex Strong and Ben Asher gave a talk on SQL Delight and how iOS and Android can use these things. Um, and then also uh, Russ Wolf gave a talk in DroidCon NYC and in DroidCon SF about multi-platform settings, which is a way to basically layer over shared preferences on Android and NS user defaults on iOS. And so communities are forming to tackle some of these problems because the promise is really uh, promising. But specifically, why we care about it as Android developers is because now we can finally share code with iOS, which really means we care about the Kotlin native side of things. So to do that, we, we, uh, we have to then start knowing how like Swift works. And we have to figure out how we can make Kotlin compatible with Swift. Which means, because of the way that Swift works, and it's OK, I'm not going to go into a bunch of iOS stuff. But the TLDR is that you do need to work through Objective-C, which is kind of like the Java of iOS days. People want to stop using it and want to move over to Swift. But um, unfortunately, for various reasons that you can see my Kotlin Conf talk on, um, you have to do so through Objective-C. But now let's talk about build speeds, because that's what we really care about and how we work in the, like, taming this Kotlin compiler. So the Kotlin compiler now has to do multi-platform native builds. What does that look like? So in the multi-platform world, it's like you have to tell the plugin which target you're building for. And as we said, we're talking about iOS. But iOS platforms don't have this compile uh, one-time run anywhere. Um, different iPhones have different ARM architectures or I, um, I86 architectures. Um, on top of that, the simulator actually runs as a different architecture than in a device. And so at the very least, if you want to run calling multi-platform code on a simulator and an iPhone, you'll need to have two targets. And so that's something to think of in this new world where we've been comforted by a JVM that we compiled it. And then it's the JVM's job to figure out how to map that to the machine, the hardware, uh, the metal underneath. Um, this is how you would do that. iOS has this concept of a framework. Um, and then you, after you link your dependencies, and something that kind of looks familiar as Android developers to Gradle, but except now you have this common and Android and iOS source set world. Um, this, is the, this is the thing here where now you have to say, OK, take this Kotlin output and put it somewhere so that Xcode can consume it. Um, this is kind of the hacky way, to be honest. Eventually, you'd probably use something like CocoaPods, which is, for better or for worse, like the Gradle dependency management analog on iOS. It's a bit different, but for the purposes of comparison, let's call it that. Um, and then finally, you'll have like you'll start coding in in um, IntelliJ or Android Studio to work with the you know common world and the platform specific world. And so to look at this visually, it's like. We know that the APK is the package format on Android representing an application. On iOS, it's the IPA format. Androids have libraries that are AAR files, but IPAs on, on iOS rely on something called frameworks. They're all going to be pointing to some common Kotlin code, because that's the whole point, using these expect actuals or maybe interface-backed implementations, um, all as layering in a shared code um, la layer. And then underneath that, maybe they're providing support for other libraries underneath. And there's this new concept called Kalib. Uh, well, it's not new, but there's a new, like, f there's a rewrite of that format coming up in upcoming uh, Kotlin releases, which essentially try to um, come up with this, um, like, neutral format for all things that Kotlin can build depending on the platform. To close up, I want to then now talk about what is the build and runtime aspects for multi-platform. And so we look at these source sets, and we see the way that we configure it in Xcode. We try to inform Xcode to invoke a Gradle task, right? Because you write some Kotlin code, and you want to do your common iOS Kotlin code, but then you want to build it and consume it in a Swift or Objective-C app. You need to tell Xcode, because of the very bespoke way in which iOS 
build systems work, um, that at some point in its pipeline, it has to call Gradle. And so it calls this. Um, one thing to, to know is that graph that I showed before, how that was generated, it's really easy to do if you just um, use GraphViz and write a little Gradle code here. Um, I, if you look, I gave a talk about two years ago at Droidcon London that goes into a lot of Gradle hacks. If, if you should look at that talk because it's like, I, I'm learning Gradle every day. <laughs> and every time I do, I learn how to hack it to get the information I need. And tools like this, being able to visualize how my task graph looks is very helpful. And so with just like a little bit of snippet of code like this, um, we can then generate what the iOS task graph looks like. And so we see like, okay, call in metadata, I don't really know what that is, but we see that it really comes down to two tasks. It comes down to compiling the iOS and linking it, which, all right, that kind of makes sense. And then there's pack for Xcode. So now we can use those same techniques I showed earlier where we look at the profile of it. And when we do that, uh, we see that a huge portion of this is spent towards linking the framework. And this scales very poorly. Um, maybe using something like CocoaPods can help with some of that. But um, that's one of the things that the native compilation portion of, of JetBrains rewrite will be very key because this is, this is kind of a very painful part right now. It's like 60%. Starting to run out of time, so let's move into the runtime performance. One of the things that I wanted to, I was very curious about is how does multi-platform run on iOS? I mean, I get, a, I get an idea of how it runs on Android, but how does it run on iOS because of the whole like bridge between Objective-C? And so I wrote merge sort three times. One time in pure Android, just Java, Kotlin, and one time in Swift, and then I analyzed the difference on, on multi-platform. It's very interesting because on in iOS platforms, there's a concept of value types. On Java, the only value types that exist are primitives, right? You call by value, you pass an integer to a method, it makes a copy on the stack, and you know that by definition, if you change that scoped integer in the body of a method, the call site didn't change. And we know that if we do that for objects in Java, we may have corrupted that object inadvertently. And that's where like, things about immutability and thread safety come up. Swift bypasses that. Arrays are value types. Structs are value types. And so a lot of these things, having to write like recursive functions and merge sort, have a little uh, different trick to them, including like, the concept of sublisting. But now we look at this like poor written Swift code on my part. We see that the Colin implementation takes twice as long to run as the Swift implementation. And so that's kind of concerning. Um, and a part of that is because of the fact that um, it has to do that bridge interop with Objective-C. However, I do want to call out the fact that it's still uh, very much under the 17 millisecond frame boundary. And so the TLDR here is like, if you're trying to write a really high performing video game, maybe I take a step back on using multi-platform. I don't know if that's, that goes against anyone's uh, goals in the room at the moment. But um, for other things like just regular apps, I think it's probably OK. And this is how it performs on the JVM, which is expected. JetBrains themselves called this out, and they're looking forward to implementing this in an upcoming version of uh, Kotlin Native. The last thing I'll talk about is the uh, multi-platform of SQL Delight. So there was a talk that Alex Strong and Ben Asher gave on this. This is more case study. If you're not familiar with SQL Delight, it's an alternative to Room. It basically lets you write SQL and generates the models for you in a very nice type safe Kotlin way. Um, and it's multi-platform, so you can share the same thing with iOS. And in fact, we do. Um, in our Android app, we have a multi-platform directory. We then share that same code in iOS. And in Cash App, we have a feature where if we look at um, the iOS and the Android version, we search for past activities. And so if you like, look at, I just looked in my activity feed at some random stranger from the internet. And um, we just compare these two versions and see how every time we're making a SQL query through multi-platform, what's that runtime performance like? And we see that, in this case, they're actually not that far off. It, it performs really well for crossing this Objective-C boundary. I have no idea why adding the O in his last name made that spike up in the end and then came back down with the N. But aside from that little detail that's probably specific to our client, um, I think this is pretty interesting. Like, you can actually use real-world functions to my earlier point. Finally, how do we debug builds? Well, I mentioned before, you use your build report uh, flags. This will give you an immense amount of information. Another thing that's really handy for me is in your Gradle task graph, 
the way that Gradle works is using input and outputs. Um, you can just print that out and just see. And so like when I debug AGP, which I do a lot, it's really helpful, helpful to know that the w every task, what input and output it needs, and then I can go into those directories, see what those output formats had, and make inferences. Again, just trying to help myself understand more. Another cool thing you could do is now that you know those output directories, you can do something like fswatch to f watch for file changes. And so if you're iterating on builds over and over and over, it's nice to see what actually changes. And so when you run this command, you can see things like uh, what's been removed, what's been added, et cetera. And that's, that's really helpful to just figure out, does the thing my build, what I expect my build to do, is it actually doing that? If not, why? Maybe file an issue. As I mentioned before, I went into a lot of this in my Android Gradle talk. There's a link there. And the last thing I do is probably, the last thing I would recommend to all of you is probably the most simplest. File issues. If you identify issues, file them. It is helpful to start a conversation with either JetBrains or with Gradle. They're open source projects and that's to our benefit. You don't have to have the most perfect sample project, but it does help. Even if you don't, show them what you've tried because then they don't have to spend that time trying it for you. And the way that you can just constrain your environment and help them help you is very beneficial. I've had people from Google, JetBrains, and Gradle hit me up on Slack and like we debug for like 10 minutes and they're like, oh, we've never seen this before. This is interesting, especially with R8 bugs. And so um, I think the more I talk to people, they're like, oh yeah, we don't want to file issues because we don't really know or we don't want to send PII. It's like, just file the issue, work with the people. You can email Google your APK like privately instead of posting it on the issue tracker. Do what it takes and help the community move it forward. And that's it. Thank you. Since we're over time, I won't be taking questions on stage, but please, if you have questions, let's talk yeah. um, on the side or one, in the outside. One question, we can time one. Oh, you have time? Fine, yeah, yeah let's take it. One question. Uh, hi. Hello. Yeah, I, I once tried mm, um, trying to speed up builds to apply plugins conditionally, and I didn't see <coughs> any mm, decrease in mm, or improvements or in build speeds. Mm, was I doing it wrong, or is it something, an approach that you've tried in Riddle? By applying plugins conditionally? Yeah, yeah, like, oh, for debug builds, don't apply this, or... Okay. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Like, it could depend on, like, what the plugin was. Do you happen to recall what the one example might have been? Because the reason why I ask that is because if Maybe it's like Maybe detect, and like I don't want to run, I don't want to apply the detect or, or other static analysis tools in right. while, while in Android Studio, just for the pipeline. Right, so if it's a, like a static analysis tool, right, it has to at least complete uh, some sort of either compilation or source generation phase in order to do that. And so um, if you're always going to compile those uh, like code, if like you're conditionally saying only do it when it reaches a compile stage, and it always reaches that compile stage, your conditional is a no-op, uh, for example, in that case. Um, I, it's, it's really hard to say without knowing, like, was this like a configuration stage problem, a task execution? So what I would say is, is like, revisit that analysis by maybe applying some of the techniques to see like, where the actual penalties occurred. Applying a plugin is no different than not having the plugin and taking the project.apply method and inlining that in your build.gradle. It's like a fancy extract method. Um, right, because it's just an encapsulation. And in fact, like if you find your build gradles having a bunch of conditional logic, not if statements, that's fine, but like, like where you're writing whole scripts um, and you don't want to work in Groovy and build, build gradle.kts sometimes is slower because of things I won't talk about right now. But like um, it, the best thing there is to move it out into a plugin and then it's exactly the same thing. You're not going to get any performance degradation of that. If you're doing like after evaluate blocks, now you have to, because of Android's variant system, push like the evaluation of certain these things down the road, and that just takes a longer configuration. But I don't know for like task execution if, for example, it's uh, not deferring I/O properly, or it's doing some if it's not parallelized. Like the Greater Worker API is really helpful. A lot of plugins haven't been rewritten to use that Worker API, and so you might not have parallelized builds. Um, and if you don't have parallelized builds you're not optimizing probably your hardware's greatest advantage. Like you'll actually have a block in a portion of your, t your graph traversal 
Um, and SQL Delay has a current problem with that that we're aiming to fix by moving to the worker API for that example. Because right now, parallelized builds only work when there are two different projects. So if you run project colon task A and project two colon task B, those can run in parallel. But if the tasks are in the same project, they can't run in parallel unless you use the worker API. And so you'll actually have tasks in one project block other tasks. So merge resources and compilation, which can happen separately, technically can't in one project unless it uses the worker API. And so you can get only partial parallelism. There's a lot of nuances of Gradle that I think kind of come out with some of these experiments. That was kind of a long-winded answer, but hopefully that gave you some uh, recipe for that. We depend on the plugin maintainers, basically. Like to yeah. Yep. Um, in that case, what I would suggest is debug the plugin. There's a flag that you can pass. It's mentioned in that talk that I referenced, but like um, hyphen capital D org dot gradle dot debug equals true. And then you can ro remote attach your IDE. If you, um, another trick you can do is um, technically your plugins sources are not available in the IDE, but aha, you can make it by making a compile only dependency in your build script temporarily. You'll now have the plugin sources on your compilation class path, which means you can remote attach and debug plugin sources. And so that's how I've learned a lot about like Kotlin plugin stuff with those tricks. But again, that was a mouthful. If you refer to that talk from London, it has all those tricks in there and more. Thank you very much for your talk, John. Thank you.